One of the features of the Bible Talk website that Hal and I do is that people can make comments. They can ask questions. They can send emails directly to me about the content or they send emails to Hal concerning technical matters. Most comments, I'm happy to say, are kind, they're encouraging, coming from people who are members of the church. But most comments are from people uh, from the United States and other countries who watch and use Bible talk materials, but who are not members of the Church of Christ, they're members of other uh, churches, uh, some of them uh, not members of churches at all. Now they have many questions, which I try to answer personally. However, one question or challenge to my teaching is often repeated and that is, why do I teach that it is possible for a Christian to lose his or her salvation? They challenge that idea. This question or challenge is expressed in different ways. For example, Someone will say, has said, quote, well, you're just preaching a works type of gospel. You're a Pharisee. I've been called worse. <laughs> this is because I insist that baptism, along with faith and repentance, is a necessary response to the gospel. The point of the objection here being that baptism is a work and we're saved by faith only. That's, I get that so many times. Another charge is that I'm preaching a salvation by discipleship. That's a new one on me. Never heard that one before. The accusation based on my insistence that Christians must grow spiritually or they'll die spiritually. The argument here being that once we are saved, nothing Nothing that we do or fail to do, like grow spiritually, for example, can cause us to lose our salvation. Nothing. Of course, these arguments and pushback are based on the notion described by the title of this sermon here, once saved, always saved. Of course, I put a question mark after, but normally there's no question mark. A lot of people believe once you're saved, that's it. There's nothing you can do that will make you unsaved. Now this debate reached a critical point recently when one of the Bible Talk viewers challenged me to name a single person in the Bible that was saved and then, according to the Bible, was lost. And he, it was a he, he said, just show me one, one, you know, underline 15 times, one person, he said. So this challenge made me realize that I had not taught specifically on the topic of once saved, always saved before. And it was time to bring some biblical clarity to this important subject. And that's what I'd like to do this morning with this lesson. On top of that, I'd like to be able to say in the future to people who challenge me, please refer to sermon once saved, always saved, so I don't have to write the response you know, 12 times a week. So that's, that's another reason. Let's look at the history of this uh, once saved, always saved idea. Perseverance of the saints, also referred to as eternal security, as well as the doctrine known as once saved, always saved, is a teaching that essentially says that once a person is born of God, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, nothing in heaven or on earth will be able to separate that person from God. And usually the proof text is Romans chapter 8, verses 39. You know, nothing in heaven and earth will separate you for the love of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, once you are saved, this is how you will always be, no matter what. Of course, no doctrine exists in a vacuum. Teachings are based or formulated to complement or to support other teachings. Same with this particular teaching. This idea, once saved, always saved, very old idea. No exception to the rule, being a doctrine originally formulated by Augustine of Hippo, who was a fourth century Catholic monk and theologian. And this is what I taught and I will quote, I won't paraphrase what he taught, I'll quote it. He said, those whom God chooses to save are given, in addition to the gift of faith, a gift of perseverance which enables them 
to continue to believe and precludes the possibility of falling away, end quote. That's where it started. Then John Calvin incorporated this idea as part of his five points of Calvinism defined and confirmed at the Synod of Dort in 1618. And very briefly, I have to give you this base material to make my points later on. Here are his five points of Calvinism. The first point being total depravity. In other words, mankind is dead spiritually and cannot want or understand the gospel or salvation unless he is enabled to do so by God's spirit. Something, God has to do something to that person for that person to want to believe or be able to believe. Second point of Calvinism, unconditional election. In other words, God chooses who He will give eternal life to without considering anything good or bad about that person. Point number three of Calvinism, limited atonement. The death and payment for sins is limited to only those chosen by God for salvation. Point number four of Calvinism, irresistible grace. God's grace to save a person cannot be resisted. In other words, you cannot say no to God. If He decides to save you, that's it, you're done. You, you have to accept it. And then number five, Perseverance of the saved. In other words, once saved, always saved. And if you notice the little acrostic on the side, this is the tulip, famous idea, how to remember the five points of Calvinism. You remember tulip, you know, total depravity, un unconditional grace, limited, uh, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saved. All right, now when someone says, what's the difference between us and our Baptist friends across the street? Or what's the difference between ourselves and our evangelical or Pentecostal or Protestant friends? What's the difference between us? The answer is not, which I often hear, the answer is not simply, well, they use instruments in their worship and we don't. Or the difference is, they have women preachers and we don't. Or they don't think baptism is necessary and we do. These are important differences, yes, but the core differences that produce these outward are twofold. Number one, they don't accept the fact that what the Bible specifically teaches about a matter is the binding and final authority, and we do. This is why they permit and encourage non-biblical practices such as women in the role of elders or pastors, preachers, so on and so forth, or instrumental music being used in worship or acceptance of openly and practicing gay members and ministers. And we reject these things and other non-biblical practices because all of the things I just mentioned cannot be supported with scripture. It's not being narrow-minded or legalistic to say that something cannot be supported by scripture, come on. And then their doctrines and practices concerning salvation are to a, a lesser or greater degree based on Calvin's five point teaching on salvation, while our teaching on salvation openly rejects these relying solely on the New Testament's plain teaching about salvation. Again, that's not being self-righteous or holier than thou, that's just staking out a position. We say when we teach about salvation, the only information included in that teaching comes from here. We don't have a theologian. We have many theologians in our brotherhood and in our history, but we don't have one theologian that has interpreted for everybody else what the Bible says. Thomas Campbell, one of the early preachers and teachers responsible for the restoration movement from which come the churches of Christ, began to reject and declare as unbiblical these teachings by Calvin that form the basic theology for most Baptist, evangelical, and Protestant churches. You're wondering, where did the break come? What happened in history? Well, this is what happened. This man here, Thomas Campbell, 
One of the reasons why the churches of Christ grew so quickly in the 19th and 20th centuries was the rejection of these Calvinist principles in favor of the simple message of salvation from the New Testament preached and taught by Church of Christ evangelists and teachers. For example, in the case of total depravity, we said, man is a sinner, yes, but not so depraved that he can't hear and respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. Where do we get that idea? Well, just read Matthew 28. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples. Watch out now. Make disciples of all the nations. Not some of the ones that God chose. No, make disciples of all the nations. And how do you do that? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. In the case of unconditional election, not unconditional election, but he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. You don't need to wait and wonder if God will choose you for salvation. Salvation's for everybody who believes and is baptized in Jesus' name. Where do we get that idea? Well, from Mark 16, 16, it's pretty plain. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. Seems to me that it puts the onus on the person who believes and is baptized. And he who has disbelieved, which one will be condemned? The one that God doesn't choose? Well, it seems to me that the Bible says, no, the one who doesn't believe, that's the one who will be condemned. As far as limited atonement is concerned, Jesus' sacrifice is not only for a precious few, but as Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.6, he gave himself as a ransom for who? Some of the people, the ones who were chosen? No, 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 no. He gave his ransom for, his sacrifice as a ransom for everybody. Everybody who does what? Everybody who believes and is baptized, that's who. How about the irresistible grace? The believer does have a part to play in his own salvation by the exercise of his will in expressing his faith through obedience. Those who believed, there's the act of will, on Pentecost Sunday expressed their belief according to Peter's command to repent and be baptized. Peter said the following, he said, now, uh, or, or Luke writes that Peter is saying, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. What did they hear? They heard the gospel. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Well, what is understood there? What do we do to be saved? And what does Peter say? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are afar off. Does that sound like the promise is just for a few? And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them. If God had just chosen the ones to be saved, would Peter have kept on exhorting them? He's trying to convince them. Why was he trying to convince them? Because he understood that the people listening to him had a choice to make. They had to make an exercise of their will. And so he exhorted them. Be saved, he said, from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Those who believe the act of will express that will according to Peter's command to repent and be baptized. The Bible doesn't say that those who were arbitrarily chosen by God came forward and were saved, it doesn't say that. Luke says that salvation, you know, that promise was for everyone that God called to Himself, not everyone that God chose. That's grammar, that's not theology, that's simple grammar. The preaching verses, the preceding verses, demonstrate how God does this calling. How does He call people? By the preaching of the gospel to all the nations. 
and there's a demonstration on Pentecost Sunday. And then in verse 41, Luke writes that those who received the word were baptized. There's no arbitrariness here. There's no irresistible grace here. The Bible says that those who believed, an act of the will, in other words, accepted as true that Jesus was the Son of God, and those who repented were baptized in His name, those people would actually receive forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't come before, the Holy Spirit came after they made the act of will. These people acted on their belief or expressed their faith according to Peter's instructions, and therein lies the difference between ourselves and our Catholic or Protestant or Evangelical and Pentecostal friends and neighbors. Their view of salvation and baptism is more highly influenced by Augustine and Calvin's teaching than they are by the New Testament's teaching on the subject. For example, in Roman Catholicism, Catholics baptize babies because they believe in total depravity. They call it original sin. A baby is born, they believe, a baby is born with sin and based on the vicarious faith of the parents or the godparents, that sin is removed at baptism. Never mind that a baby cannot repent or give an assent of will according to the New Testament, Catholic dogma and tradition trump basic Bible teaching. That's what's happening. Most Protestant, Evangelical, Pentecostal groups Calvinistic teaching has crystallized into traditions and practices where people do things not even aware of why they do them. When I talk to some Baptist people that I know and we happen to get to talk about religion, they can't explain why they believe what they believe. They don't know the background of it. The teaching on baptism being a prime example. These groups don't see the necessity of baptism because it represents man's conscious participation in his own salvation. And they reject that idea. The, the problem is, <laughs> baptism becomes that pesky thing. What do you do with it? You know, the Bible says over and over, you got to do it, but they, you know, they, they don't know what to do with the thing. If, as Calvin teaches, God chooses you and you can't resist him, His choosing, then baptism has no real purpose, since it represents your response to God's offer of salvation. This is why evangelical and Baptists accept Jesus into their hearts. Now that term, accept Jesus into your heart, that's not a biblical term. You can't find that anywhere in the New Testament as a response of faith. No, 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 they, 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 they say that because they have no say in the matter other than to accept what God has done. This is why they come up with so many tortured explanations for the role of baptism, none of which are supported by any scripture. You know, it's an outward sign of an inward grace. Show me the passage. That's all I ask you, show me the passage. Or it's a symbol of your salvation. Really, show me the passage. Or it's a witness that we are already saved. Really, show me the passage. Seems to me that when Peter is preaching, remember Peter the apostle, he's saying repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. Seems to me grammatically, textually, historically, the repentance and the baptism come here and then the salvation comes afterward, not before. So if baptism is essential, as we believe the Bible teaches, then this undermines the theological framework that supports their practices and public teaching. This then brings us to the fifth of Calvin's five point doctrinal theory. I have good news, everything I've just said is preamble. Here's the sermon. <laughs> Fifth point of Calvin's five point doctrinal theory, the perseverance of the saints. Those chosen by God can never lose their salvation. Now restorationists, Church of Christ teachers, restorationists taught that man's continued salvation is based on his continued faith. And those who remain faithful until death or Christ's return, whichever comes first, these will be saved. It seems Jesus himself said it in Matthew 24, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And in the debate or you know, back and forth that I had with a lot of people say, oh, well that scripture is only talking about you know, the millennial reign, it's only talking about the end times. So what? So what? 
you either have to be saved to the end now or when, you know, when Jesus comes or during the millennial reign or whenever it is, it still says what it says. You have to be faithful to the end of whatever era you're in in order to maintain your salvation. In answer to the statement, show me one person in the Bible who was saved and then lost. Here are some examples of this transformation. What about Lucifer? He was called Morning Star and was created and anointed as a guardian cherub. Isaiah and Ezekiel write of his change and fall from that position because of his own actions. Ezekiel 28, you were the anointed cherub who covers and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless, perfect, without sin. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Isaiah, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, sun of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So here we see that he fell from this position because of his own actions, his own pride and lost forever. Lost, truly? Where does it say that? Revelation 20, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Don't pray for the devil. He's done. The answer to the question, can someone be saved? Excuse me, can someone who is saved, you know, someone who is with God be lost? This question was answered with Lucifer's fall from perfection before the world was even created. That answer was given. But let's look at some others, shall we? How about Cain? Cain was not a lost person. He even consciously worshiped God as did his brother Abel. God even warned him of his potential fall in verse chapter four, he says, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you and you must master it. That was a warning, be careful. You're going to fall, be careful. So there was a, a, a moment there where he had to make a choice. And what happened? Cain made the wrong choice. He became an unrepentant murderer. And unrepentant murderers are not in heaven. We know that, Galatians 5.21. Let's take another example. Judas. Judas was a Jew. He was among God's people, chosen as an apostle. And he, like the other apostles, went out to preach and heal and cast out spirits, right? In Matthew 10, it says, these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Judas was among that group. But there was a precise spiritual tipping point where Judas rejected the faith he had and gave in to his disbelief, dishonesty, and greed. In John chapter 13, verse 26, Jesus then answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan entered into him. What does it say? After he took the morsel, then Satan entered. Satan was not in him when he went out to preach with the 12. Satan was with him when he finally decided he was going to reject all of that. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. You know, God did not force Judas to believe or disbelieve. He merely knew in advance what Judas would choose and folded that knowledge into his plan and to his purpose. Peter pronounces the obvious end to the unrepentant traitor. 
in Acts chapter one, when he talks about you know, replacing Judas and he talks about Judas who would occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Again, Peter is saying that Judas, what did he do? He turned aside, he chose to go the other way, to go to his own place. What place is that? The place of condemnation for having disbelieved and uh, uh, rejected the faith. One more. How about the seven churches and the seven angels? One of the most dramatic examples of the possibility of losing salvation is found in the book of Revelation. John explains his vision of the seven lampstands and the seven stars, one verse. He says, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. In this vision, John receives a message from Jesus for the seven churches at that time located in Asia Minor. Each message contains an encouragement as well as a warning for each church. The encouragements are positive comments on these churches' faithfulness and perseverance and their service and their love. The warnings, however, are all the same. The warnings are, number one, the churches must endure and overcome and remain faithful until death or Jesus uh, Jesus' return if they are to receive the reward, which is described in different ways. Uh, uh, John writes either uh, you must uh, endure to the end in order to eat of the tree of life or not be hurt by the second death or receive the hidden manna or the white stone or the new name, all different ways of saying eternal life or the eternal reward, all refer to uh, 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 the reward of those who endure until the end. And then the second part, which is understood, is that those who don't do this will not receive this reward. In verse five he says, therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. What does that mean? Is that a slap on the wrist? If you remove the lampstand, where are you? You're in the darkness. Heaven is not ever referred to in the Bible as darkness. So if you're in the darkness, you're not in, you're not in heaven. So these passages teach that the saved by their conscious faithfulness maintain their salvation. If individuals were chosen in advance by God for salvation and could never be lost once they were saved, there would be no need for these verses. Why these verses? If there is no possibility that once saved, a Christian could never lose that salvation, why would the Holy Spirit through the inspired writers give us the following verses? Just a couple. How about Galatians 5? I it was for freedom that Christ set us free, therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. You know, Paul is warning the Galatian Christians that if they forsake the gospel, the, the, which is what saves them, and they succumb to the false teachers who are preaching a salvation based on the law, primarily, being circumcised and you know, keeping food laws and so on and so forth. He said, if you do that, you're cut off from Christ. Notice he doesn't say if you rob a bank or if you cheat on your wife or you do some sort of immoral bad thing. He's not even saying that. He's saying if you abandon the idea that you're saved by Jesus Christ and decide to go back to try to be saved by the law and the expression of this would be being circumcised and keeping food laws. If you do that, he says, you're cut off from Christ. I don't know about you, but cut off from Christ, that doesn't sound very good. <laughs> that doesn't sound like I'm still saved, if you know what I mean. They're cut off from Christ. They're fallen from grace. This is another dramatic way of saying that they're lost. I mean, what else could it mean? Another scripture, 2 Peter 2. He says, these are springs 
speaking of people making trouble in the church, these are springs without water and mists driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the, wood, uh, of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse than the first state. Did you hear what he just said? They were saved, they were okay, and then they got tangled up in the world and sin and they went back. Does that sound like they're still saved to you? For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. Again, a warning against false teachers, this time promoting teachings that enable believers to sin without any spiritual consequences, labeling their heresies as a type of liberation theology or, or religious freedom. That's what was going on here that Peter was writing about. Note that Peter traces the dangerous consequences for believers who fall into this trap. They're freed from the trap of sin by Jesus, the gospel, but then because of false teaching which they choose to believe, they return to the trap. Peter says that the last state, being trapped in sin and lost, but knowing Christ, is worse than the first state, being trapped in sin and lost, but at least ignorant of Christ. If one was saved without the possibility of being lost, why would Peter write this? There'd be no point to this, unless Peter was confused. And then of course there's Hebrews, uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter six, uh, verses uh, one to six. Now this here passage was written to Jewish Christians who were struggling with their faith and they were tempted to quit and return to Judaism or just return to the world as unbelievers. Now in most of the letter, the writer to the Hebrew explains how Christianity is superior and the fulfillment of the Jewish religion. And, and to return to Judaism would be a forfeiture of all the blessings they had in Christ, including eternal salvation. If one could not be lost, again, I ask the question, why would there be a need for this warning in this letter? In chapter six, the writer graphically describes what happens to one who abandons Christ for another religion or for the world. He says in verse one, therefore leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. I'll stop there. Here the writer establishes the identity of the person he's writing to. Listen to, listen to what he's saying to them. He says, they're enlightened, meaning they have the knowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. They understand that God's method of salvation is through the, atone, the atoning work of Jesus. They have been revealed uh, 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 the future that they will have, the resurrection that is to come. They have that enlightenment. He says, they've tasted of the heavenly gifts, peace and joy that comes from forgiveness. They have been partakers of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 says the Spirit comes within you, the, the Spirit indwells you uh, at the moment of baptism. And in Romans 8.13, the influence of the Holy Spirit in our uh, uh, prayer life and in our conduct, in our study, and so on and so forth. This is how Christians partake of the Holy Spirit. They, he says, have tasted the good word. In other words, the powers of the age to come. Well, uh, Christians are witnesses of the transforming power of God's work in their own lives and in the lives of other people. At that time, many of them had spiritual gifts of healing and speaking in tongues and so on and so forth. And so it is clear that he is talking about Christians here. He's not talking about lost people. 
I mean, lost people are not enlightened. They haven't tasted the gift of the Spirit. They, have, they, they don't have hope of resurrection. Those are, those, those. He's talking to saved people here, okay? So let's just read the last two verses. He says, and then, these people here, and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. I don't know about you, but that's not good news. That doesn't say you'll always be saved. It doesn't matter if you fall away. You'll never be separated from God. I don't, I don't get that from that passage. He clearly states what happens. The believer falls away and does so by rejecting and abandoning the things that he's just described. The author then describes what happens to the one who has done this. It produces sinfulness and disbelief. You know, the thistles and the thorns. And this type of product is considered worthless and close to being, and you know when he says close to being cursed? Well, how, how are these people close to being cursed? Well, they're still alive. There's still some time maybe, but they're awfully close to being cursed. And then he says, and being burned. Yeah, being burned. That's the final judgment. That's the final loss at judgment. Now Calvinists say that the reason this person fell and was lost is because they were never really chosen by God in the first place. They were insincere or they were just pretending to be Christians or give some other reason. When I bring up this passage here, this is what they say to me. However, the author of Hebrews doesn't say this. He doesn't even suggest it. The person he is describing is a genuine Christian who because of weakening faith and the draw of the world eventually rejected Christ and renounced his faith through worldly living as opposed to spiritual living and as a result stands condemned and will bear the punishment due a judgment. That's what he's saying. That's not what I'm saying. Again, don't, don't be mad at me. You see, The free will that we have enables us to go in, in either direction. It's the highway to heaven, but it's also the highway to hell. It's what makes us human. It's what makes our love to God and our love for God meaningful. It's what makes it worth something. So I hope that this study, which is difficult to hear, is nevertheless clear about what the Bible teaches concerning the possibility of one losing their salvation. This is not meant to be a, an encouraging or, you know, I've preached encouraging and uplifting sermons, but this isn't one of those. This sermon is meant to be sobering. There's a time for everything under the sun. And so this morning, it's a time for sober consideration as mature Christians. So let me close with an admonition to sober mindedness and the reason that this is necessary. And this passage is found in 1 Peter. He says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. I repeat once again, if it were impossible to be lost, you know, once saved, why would Peter warn Christians to be sober-minded and aware of Satan's efforts to destroy us if that was not possible? However, sober-mindedness doesn't mean being afraid. I said the purpose was not to make you afraid, but to make you sober-minded. I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm not afraid of falling away. I'm not afraid that I might lose my salvation. I'm not afraid of that. Being sober-minded means that I am aware. 
I'm aware that he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. I am aware that God cares for me and does not want any believer to be lost. And when God is on your side, wanting you to be saved and remain saved, when God is on your side, I mean, who can defeat you? The only person who can defeat you is yourself. I am aware that God Himself through the Holy Spirit within me has promised to create and perfect the image of Christ's character upon me. I'm aware of that. I am aware that God has given me everything I need to remain faithful to the end. He's given me the words of Christ to save me and guide me and keep my soul. He's given me the church of Christ to minister to me, to train me to minister to others and to help me remain faithful. The work of the shepherds is to help all of us remain faithful. He has also given me the Holy Spirit sent by Christ to comfort me and strengthen me and at the end of time raise me up from the dead to be with the Lord forever. So I am not afraid, but I am sober minded and I am aware. Let us therefore be sober minded and consider these things as we stand and sing a song of encouragement for those who may need strength to continue believing despite trials, and also invite those who have not yet chosen to obey the gospel in repentance and baptism, or who may have fallen back and choose to be restored. This song invites you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing.